Hello, this is Stefan Lorenz with High Lonesome Bird Tours. Uh, I will give a short presentation about uh, Dutch Harbor, one of the lesser known birding destinations in Alaska. And we do a tour there every year in June. And um, it is a really phenomenal trip, not just for birds, but also for landscape, uh, marine wildlife, uh, wildflowers, history and culture. And this trip is often considered uh, to be one of the last trips people usually take when they take our Alaska tours and some people consider it kind of a one species trip uh, for the rare whiskered auklet uh, which you can see on this cover page here and uh, the whiskered auklet is most easily seen out of Dutch Harbor so it is a, a great trip to come to grips with this uncommon alcet which is very difficult to find in other parts of Alaska but there's plenty of other things to see in Unalaska or Dutch Harbor, uh, many other bird species, and like I said, some phenomenal landscapes. So Dutch Harbor is actually the name for the body of water that forms the natural harbor. The island itself is known as Unalaska. And Unalaska is about 1,200 kilometers from Anchorage, or about 800 miles and it takes uh, a good two hours to get there by a direct flight. And if you see here, um, down in the bottom left corner, you can see uh, where Mark Dutch Harbor and this uh, large island that's Unalaska Island. That's our destination. It is part of the Fox Island group, which uh, forms some of the easternmost islands of the Aleutian Islands. The Aleutian Islands are actually sedimentary islands that are capped by volcanoes. And by visiting Unalaska, it's quite clear. I mean, the uh, volcanic activity is quite obvious. Uh, even when you come down, flying down the Alaska Peninsula to reach Unalaska, uh, oftentimes if the weather is clear, you can see many volcanic uh, cones in the distance, and it's uh, quite a dramatic flight. Unalaska, the shape of the island is quite different from many Aleutian islands. There are lots of bays, lots of uh, almost fjord-like uh, indentations in the shoreline, uh, quite convoluted. And of course it makes for great natural harbors. And that's why Dutch Harbor, or I should actually say Unalaska, has uh, really become popular. Uh, it's a large island. It's the second largest island in the Aleutian island chain. Uh, it's about 80 by 35 miles, and most of it is really rugged wilderness. So here's a bit of an overview of the area that we do cover. The airport and part of the town of Unalaska is actually located on Amaknak Island, which is a small island that you can see um, just uh, up left from center there. And it's connected to the main island of Unalaska, by a bridge and it's uh, that bridge is actually known the bridge to the other side um, most of the processing plants a lot of the harbor installations are found on Amaknak Island including the hotel and uh, some of the remainder of town is just across the bridge found on Unalaska so again most people refer to this area as just simply Dutch Harbor and uh, part of the confusion is that when you book a plane and you have your ticket in hand, you're actually flying to Dutch Harbor. But again, that's just the body of water. Uh, technically, the island is known as Unalaska Island and the town is known as Unalaska City. And it's home to about 3,000 residents. And it really depends. That number goes up and down. There are lots of processing plants, lots of port activity. So a lot of people coming and going. Uh, to this area, so that number goes up and down. Here's a great overview of uh, the Grand Aleutian Hotel. This is our home for three nights. So our trip is uh, two full days on the island and the better part of a third day. And uh, that extra time allows us to compensate potentially for weather because we do take a long pelagic trip out of Dutch Harbor in order to see the Whiskered Auckland. So by having almost three days in the area, we can really uh, make up for weather days if we need to. But usually the seas around here are not too rough, and we've always been able to make it out 
and usually at our preferred time and day. So it's quite a busy town. Uh, it has a lot of amenities, grocery store, hardware store, several restaurants, two post offices actually. But uh, we usually just eat at the Grand Illusion, uh, our lunches and dinners. They oftentimes have a great seafood buffet and delicious dinners. And it's a really comfortable place to stay. And in many ways, a fairly relaxed trip. Uh, we do spend uh, a full day out at sea, but we also um, take good rest after that and before. And for our days on the island, we uh, go exploring along the overland road, check some of the museums, and in general, just have a great time. Here's another image showing the town of Unalaska. Uh, looking across the bay here, so that's actually looking from Amaknak Island towards the island of Unalaska. In the background you can see a little bit of a quarry there, and that's actually where the overland drive goes to, which is a, a well-maintained gravel road that leads up into the higher reaches of the island and allows us to bird some of the higher tundra. There's also a historic Russian Orthodox Church on the island, this church right here was built in 1894, so it's more than 100 years old and always a, a neat place to stop and visit. Oftentimes, uh, somebody will give us a tour and we get to go inside and explore a bit. And just a really neat uh, part of the history of uh, Unalaska. And if you guys are familiar with uh, The Deadliest Catch, a reality TV show that started in 2005, uh, lots of it is centered around Dutch Harbor, where many of the ships and captains go uh, during the show. And every once in a while, you actually see a ship that's featured on the deadliest catch. In this case, the Northwestern was pulled up into the harbor here. There are lots of remnants of uh, World War II. So uh, there was a large installation here called the uh, Dutch Harbor Naval Base and Fort Mears. There were, at some point, uh, up to 60,000 troops on the island, uh, since this was a very strategic point during World War II. And it was actually bombed by the Japanese on June 3rd and 4th of 1942. So it was attacked um, by Japanese aircraft carriers. And, uh, but after the end of World War II, it was quickly abandoned. Uh, but there are lots of remnants uh, of these and pillboxes that you see here up on the hillside, uh, lots of Quonset huts and trenches that adds another piece of history to the island. There are also two museums on the island, uh, one focusing on World War II and then one called the Museum of the Aleutians focusing on the native uh, culture of the Aleutian Islands and uh, really well worth visiting and we usually make a stop there to see the exhibition which really adds um, a lot of information to our visit uh, to Unalaska. Now, of course, it's, uh, although it's quite busy, uh, it's still a very peaceful island, lots of wilderness area left. This is the view just right in front of the hotel, and oftentimes there are whales present and uh, murrelets right offshore. You can see a couple of uh, glaucous wing gulls, the ever-present glaucous wing gulls, I should say, resting on the rocks here at low tide. There's also um, a Sitka spruce park in town and there are a couple of groves of Sitka spruce trees. They're not native to the Aleutians, they're native to southeast Alaska and these are remnants of uh, an air force station uh, program that the Russians attempted trying to introduce, introduce trees to the Aleutian Islands and while they can grow here, they don't really propagate well. They usually grow uh, very slowly and stay mostly small. But it provides a unique patch of habitat and a nice way to see some trees while we're here. And uh, interestingly, a lot of the rare or unusual species that have shown up on Unalaska Island have uh, shown up in these uh, groves of spruce trees. Uh, actually, uh, really recently, uh, I think about a week ago, an oriental green finch was found on Unalaska. And, uh, of course, not surprisingly, it was found on uh, one of the groves of the Sitka spruce trees. Um, a couple years ago, there was a Eurasian siskin that spent uh, several months on Unalaska. 
also among these trees and common cuckoo has been seen. So although it is uh, fairly close to the Alaskan mainland compared to some of the other Aleutian Islands, uh, occasionally it does get some vagrants and rarities uh, from Eurasia. The main part of the island, of course, is covered in maritime tundra, which is very lush, composed mainly of ryegrass, wild celery, flea bane, coastal paintbrush, scurvy grass, and uh, a large number of other plants. It's a very lush uh, vegetation, not like a traditional tundra, which tends to be pretty short. This vegetation can grow uh, to hip height or even more in sheltered gullies, uh, especially. And during the time that we visit, in, um, towards the end of June, lots of wildflowers are blooming and the island is bright green. Here you can see part of the overland drive that we take for one day. It's a really uh, nice morning exploration. Uh, we drive up from the coastal area to uh, pretty high into the mountains and some of the higher tundra. And you can see uh, oftentimes the weather is a bit drizzly and foggy. The island does receive about 64 inches of rain per year. But it oftentimes clears up too. And uh, we've had many um, beautiful days like this during our visits. Uh, bright blue skies, sunny conditions, uh, really fun to explore the island. And here we're at the higher part of the road. You can see we get uh, shorter vegetation on this more windshorn and exposed tundra. This is mainly dominated by willows, crowberries, mosses, and some low ferns. And this right here uh, tends to be a great spot to see rock sandpipers on the island, which are uh, very uncommon, surprisingly so, as a nesting species. There's lots of water on the island too, lots of streams, ponds, and lakes that we can explore. This is another great spot for rock sandpiper. And uh, you can see during this time of year, it's just really lush and uh, beautiful, beautiful to look at. And here's some more scenery. You can see uh, in the rugged mountains in the distance there, there's still some snow. And uh, the highest point of the island, Makushin Volcano, which is uh, just a bit over 2,000 meters or 6,680 feet, is actually uh, completely covered in snow and glaciated. And it's a uh, moderately active uh, Makushin volcano with its last activity recorded in 1995. Here, uh, for botanists, this is an absolute dream. Uh, lots of uh, plants to look at. Here are some beautiful fiddleheads and some of the ferns. Here's a willow. Of course, they uh, grow mostly low right up to the ground. Although there are some sheltered valleys that we explore where some of the willow trees uh, grow quite a bit higher. There are lots of lupines, um, beautiful flower. You can see mayflowers. Um, there are half a dozen orchids found on Unalaska. Here's the beautiful and one of the more common ones, the bog orchid, flea bane. Uh, some of the berries are also flowering. Um, they won't be ready to be harvested until August, September, of course. And avens. And of course, this is a birding tour, so we will um, focus to some degree on wildflowers, but our main aim, of course, are birds. And Dutch Harbor is synonymous with bald eagles. Uh, I've never been to a place uh, where as many bald eagles as you can find on Unalaska Island. One of the more interesting stories we had was during one trip, we returned to the Grand Aleutian Hotel and uh, some local fishermen would pull up a net and they spread it out uh, in the large parking lot, sort of right in front of the hotel, and uh, to fix it. And some bald eagles started drifting in to investigate and look for scraps uh, of fish and other things caught in the net. And uh, first there were five, then a dozen, then two dozen, then we counted uh, more than 50, and they kept coming and coming and coming some of them perching on the light posts around the parking lot, some of them perching right on the roof of the hotel, uh, perching on the roof of the Safeway. And uh, I took a photo with my cell phone, a 360-degree photo, and uh, was later able to uh, roughly count of how many there were 
surrounding this whole scene, and it was more than 150. Uh, quite an impressive sight. And uh, so, yeah, bald eagles are all over the island, uh, easy to see and easy to photograph. Always, uh, when the light is nice, always fun to spend a little bit of time uh, getting some nice photos of these guys. Oftentimes there are nests in town or just outside of town that can be easily seen. And here, um, I don't think there are too many post offices in the uh, United States with this sign. Uh, it's kind of hard to see the sign in the foreground there, but it says Danger Nesting Eagles. And every year there's a pair of uh, bald eagles that nest on a small bluff right behind the post office. And um, they regularly uh, attack uh, visitors to the post office as they're going in and out of the building. So you always need to keep an eye out for the bald eagles. Some of the other large land birds that we see in Unalaska are common ravens are everywhere, uh, very prevalent, hanging out with the bald eagles at the local landfill. And uh, in some parts of the island uh, have seen rough-legged hawks, which probably nest in some of the more remote parts of the island at higher elevations, but not common. So we do spend a day and a half uh, before and after the pelagic oftentimes exploring the island, exploring the lakes. There are a few waterfowl present, uh, like greater scop. In the base, we can oftentimes find harlequin ducks in good numbers, actually, uh, several dozen uh, for great views. So this is a really uh, neat bird to see. And one year we even found a male Barrow's golden eye, which is quite common in the uh, mainland of Alaska, but pretty uncommon in the Aleutian Islands. And one year we even found a lingering king eider, which is really rare this time of year uh, in this part of Alaska, but it made a nice addition to the list. And we actually had somebody on the tour uh, who had never been to Alaska before. This was their first venture to Alaska. And it was quite interesting. He was getting a lot of excellent lifers um, just by visiting uh, Unalaska Island. And he actually asked me um, before the tour, he was really interested in seeing alcits and seabirds, and he asked me, uh, what is the best trip for um, getting a good diversity of seabirds and alcits? And I kind of did the calculation. And it turned out, and I was surprised a little bit myself, that Dutch Harbor is the best trip that we do for alcid diversity with 14 species possible. There's no other trip except for possibly Gamble, Alaska, that can net you that many alcids. So that's, that's another interesting point for this trip, even if you've never been to Alaska. It is not a bad place to start. And we can also oftentimes find common eiders. Uh, interestingly, we see these mostly during our pelagic trip. We visit some small islands where uh, birds are present and nesting. Some of the other land birds we see that are really interesting are rock ptarmigan, uh, which the first time I visited the island were very common and in recent years are uh, quite scarce actually, but we do have one or two spots where we can usually find a male and oftentimes even watch them display. They do this really neat flight display uh, as they're calling. So uh, rock ptarmigans are present on Unalaska Island. Some of the shorebirds here include a semi-palmated plover, which nests on the island in very small numbers, and also rock sandpiper, uh, represented here by the subspecies Kuziang. And uh, this is the subspecies that nests in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, it's a bit less colorful and a bit smaller than the nominate subspecies on St. Paul Island. And interestingly, it is not common on Unalaska. I know of only uh, two territories within the areas that we can access, but we can usually always find a pair and get great views of uh, these breeding rock sandpipers. And there are also small numbers of least sandpipers. And by small numbers, I mean I'm aware of maybe one or two territories, again, in the areas that we can access. But um, this is really at the range limit here of nesting least sandpipers. But it's really fun to track them down 
and they do this incredible flight display. They go really, really high up in the sky and hover and call uh, before they come back down onto the tundra. And they also uh, Wilson snipe around. So Wilson snipes do uh, seem to nest in good numbers in some of the wetter areas on the island. And along the coast, we can often find uh, black oyster catchers, which are uh, very common. And there are a couple of really small islets and rocky uh, areas where we can find several pairs of these uh, beautiful shorebirds. In the spruces, uh, it's pretty easy to find Pacific Wren. Uh, Unalaska Island probably is the best place to photograph and get fantastic views of Pacific Wren. Uh, they're much more ready to come out into the open here versus some of the other areas where they breed. I'm thinking sort of the northwestern rainforest where they're oftentimes in these uh, dark, damp forests and it's not that easy to get clear views of them, but on Unalaska, uh, they come right out into the open. There are also uh, song sparrows that nest on the island. This is not the Maxima subspecies, this is sort of an intermediate. Uh, this is the Sanaka subspecies. It's still pretty large and fairly dark overall compared to uh, song sparrows in other parts of the U.S. And uh, just really neat to watch these guys. And these are resonant in the Aleutian Islands. And here was one that set up its singing post on a little wind vane and uh, this was sort of spinning around and swinging back and forth and the bird just held on and was uh, singing away. There are also nesting savannah sparrows on the island that add a little bit of uh, color and a nice song. And a few pairs of sooty fox sparrows and again these uh, really key in on the uh, Sitka spruce trees also. So I wonder whether their population has actually increased a little bit um, because there is more proper habitat. But they also occur in some of the natural uh, willow thickets that grow in some of the sheltered valleys and along some of the streams. And there are lots of gray crowned rosy finches. Um, here the subspecies with a fully gray head and uh, these are very large compared to other uh, rosy finches in other parts of the U.S. And these are quite common on the island. And lots of Lapland longspurs nesting here too. Uh, one of the most common and numerous species on Unalaska. As soon as you leave the airport, one will usually fly by. And in higher parts and more rocky areas of Unalaska, they are also... Uh, nesting snow buntings, so it's really neat to see the males in full breeding plumage and uh, they have a beautiful song and uh, they oftentimes prefer areas with uh, rocky cliffs and they nest in these uh, natural rock crevices or this one right here set up a territory in one of the older quarry areas. And more surprisingly to some maybe uh, is nesting uh, American pipits. So in uh, some of the higher tundras, um, when you get above this maritime tundra and you get into the shorter spares of vegetation, there are nesting American pipits present. And we can usually find a pair or two along the overland drive. And even more surprising, uh, at least it was for me the first time I visited uh, Unalaska Island, were nesting American dippers. So again, uh, this is right at the limit of their range here, but uh, there is a bridge that usually has a nesting pair of American dippers. And I know that uh, to many uh, folks that have gone with me on this tour, belted kingfishers are also very surprising. Yeah, there are uh, several pairs of belted kingfishers. They oftentimes are mostly around town along one of the streams there and they have plenty of sandbanks and bluffs to nest in so they do quite well uh, on Unalaska and again uh, at the limit of their range here. We also see red poles, uh, mostly common red poles although on some tours I have seen uh, birds that look like hoary red poles, uh, difficult to say sometimes but common red poles do nest uh, on the island in very small numbers and every once in a while we get a surprising species. Uh, you can clearly see 
this was uh, among one of the Sitka spruce groves, uh, white wing crossbill. So one year there was a small group of white wing crossbills that had uh, spent apparently the entire winter there and was staying into the summer. And interestingly, the Eurasian siskin associated with these guys uh, for several months before it disappeared. So we always check those little groves of Sitka spruce trees several times during our visit. Always need to see uh, what we can add to, to the trip list. There are a few mammals on land here, uh, including red foxes, which are most likely were introduced to the island. Uh, difficult to say whether they're native or not native, but there are red foxes, uh, including um, the all uh, black forms. Uh, and they can often be seen uh, around the edges or even in town. And there are quite a few uh, Arctic ground squirrels on the island, and these are native to Unalaska. Uh, neat squirrel and uh, really fun as they're giving their alarm whistles when we walk by. So to give you a, a sense of the route we take for the Pelagic trip, uh, of course that is one of the main reasons to visit Unalaska, and uh, of course the highlight of the tour. Uh, we do take the pelagic trip in order to see uh, many of the seabirds and, of course, the whiskered auklet. And we go out um, usually uh, mid-morning and stay out at sea between 10 and 12 hours. Uh, we use an excellent uh, ship that's uh, based out of, uh, locally based out of Unalaska with a very experienced skipper uh, who knows exactly where we need to go and what we need to see and uh, they're really able to accommodate us well in order to find our target species. And uh, they provide lunch and a delicious celebratory dinner right on board. Uh, it's, the ship can take uh, six passengers, so oftentimes it is the captain and I will act as the assistant and deckhand and guiding, and then we have uh, our six participants. So that actually limits this tour to six participants, which makes it a really nice small group trip. So we leave from uh, the harbor in Unalaska, and we oftentimes first head out north to the Chilan Banks. And this is an area of upwelling, and uh, it's really uh, an excellent place to see many of the pelagic species that we're looking for, many of the tube noses, shear waters and albatross. So we spend quite a bit of time there depending on the weather. Uh, we oftentimes start chumming, lay down a little bit of an oil slick and see what we can attract. After these uh, Chilan banks we move east and we head to an area called the Baby Islands. And this is really the main area for the whiskered auklet. So they nest in this area and they prefer to feed in these passes between these islands. They really prefer these uh, riptides that move through these islands and create upwelling, and that's where they will feed in large numbers. And we can see between several hundred to several thousands. Um, our captain will know the best time of the day to arrive there. It usually is, uh, works well with an incoming tide and uh, then we spend several hours there uh, studying the alcids, uh, photographing the whiskered auklets, and see what else we can find. So uh, as we head out, uh, there's still beautiful landscape to be seen. You can see some of the distant mountains here as we're leaving the harbor. And uh, the Unalaska really has a rugged shoreline. Uh, you can see the dramatic erosion here of these volcanic islands and we motor along the shoreline for a little while before we head out to more open water. And here's an image actually of the group of the baby islands. So those small passes between these islands are really the favored area for whiskered auklets. And we're usually able to go in there and oftentimes what we'll do is we let the ship drift for a little bit which allows us to get very close to uh, all the alcids that feed in this area. As we leave the harbor, of course, we uh, still have plenty of glaucous winged gulls. Uh, they usually start following the ship or resting on some of the rocks along the shoreline. 
But pretty quickly we pick up more open ocean or pelagic species uh, like black-legged kittiwakes and then very quickly northern fulmars. In this part of the range along the Aleutian Islands most of the fulmars are the dark morphs uh, although we see um, lighter morphs or intermediate morphs also. Uh, we see several hundreds of uh, fulmars during our pelagic trip. And then as we uh, get uh, further out into some of the more areas of upwelling, we'll start seeing shearwaters. And uh, on some outings, we've seen tens of thousands of short-tailed shearwater. So pretty much all the shearwaters here are short-tailed. Um, technically, sooty shearwater uh, would be possible, but would be uh, very tricky to pick out among these thousands of short-tailed shearwaters. And, uh, of course, we also get closer views of them as they come uh, to follow the boat and to check out the chum that we are providing. And this is what the scene typically looks like uh, when we get to the Chilan banks and we start putting down an all slick and start chumming. So you can see lots of uh, glaucous wing gulls following the ship. And then um, a few, there's a single short-tailed shearwater cutting through, a couple of fulmars. And then the first albatross will show up. And these are Lazan albatross. And uh, they come all the way up to the Bering Sea, to the Aleutian Islands from the Hawaiian breeding grounds. So they travel enormous distances. And we get great views of these uh, Lazan albatross. Uh, they oftentimes start following the boat, making repeated flybys. So the photographic opportunities are fantastic. And we really get to study them well. And uh, you can see one here diving in right among the northern fulmars, uh, looking for some of the chum that we're throwing out behind the boat. So they can be extremely close to us. And here's another one that was just sort of cruising along. And uh, the numbers vary that we see uh, between a dozen to maybe 30. So we do see good numbers of Lazan albatross. We also usually get black-footed albatross, although in much lower numbers. Uh, I think the highest we ever had was maybe three birds. But uh, they will also come in to investigate the boat as we're going along and also provide fantastic uh, photographic opportunities. And uh, these are quite a bit bigger than Lazan albatross uh, with an all-dark bill. And then the adults usually have uh, this sort of frosted forehead and the white uh, around the base of the bill. And uh, if we're really lucky, we'll get to see this guy. Uh, the largest of the uh, northern Pacific albatross species, the short-tailed albatross, which of course, uh, unfortunately, was nearly extinct. And they have recovered um, due to uh, many efforts on their nesting grounds, and they're increasing in number. So it's becoming more and more likely to see one of these during the tour. Um, we see them every few years. Uh, definitely cannot be expected, but uh, always hoped for. And this particular one was quite interesting. Uh, this is a, a juvenile, but very easy to identify with this sort of uh, bubblegum colored bill. And uh, that particular uh, outing, I was on the back deck uh, cutting up fish for chumming and I kind of glanced over my shoulder and I just saw this uh, big uh, albatross coming in and uh, I just mentioned to somebody oh we need to take a closer look at that uh, I quickly saw the bill color and then I started chumming like I've never chummed before um, just almost threw everything we had uh, overboard at once to try to bring in the bird and uh, fortunately for us we were actually able to follow it after it disappeared a bit and then it came in and stayed with us for more than an hour, just uh, really neat to get fantastic views of this short-tailed albatross that uh, came close to the boat several times. And uh, you can see uh, the size compared to the northern fulmars here. And that was definitely one of the highlights from that particular trip. Sometimes we also get Jaegers passing by. This was a long-tailed Jaeger that circled the boat uh, several times during one of the trips. And most interestingly, in recent years, we have had great luck with red-legged kittiwake. 
so red-legged kittiwake is mainly found on the Pribilof Islands, um, uh, quite a bit north of uh, Unalaska, the Aleutians. But in recent years, we had up to four of them. And uh, when they do show up, they tend to follow the ship for quite a while. So they oftentimes are very confiding and curious and checking out the chum and uh, provide great photo opportunities. So um, it's possible that some of the breeding colonies that are found uh, nearby in the Aleutians, the populations are increasing and this will be a much more regular species on our Dutch Harbor tour, which is a really great addition and potentially saves people a trip to the Pribilofs. Of course, everybody should go to the Pribilofs once, but um, it appears that Dutch Harbor is becoming a reliable location for this really range-restricted and beautiful gull. And you can see in this image right here, they're quite different from the uh, black-legged kittiwakes, not just in terms of leg color, but they also have a much darker mantle, shorter bill, uh, almost have no neck, and a very large eye, because they do um, appear to feed a lot uh, in the dark or at night. And of course, alcids are one of the uh, main staples of this pelagic. So uh, as we leave the harbor, uh, we see good numbers of pigeon guillemots, which of course are also easy to see from land. This is really an inshore alcid. And then as we get a bit further out into the uh, bays, we start looking for murrelets. Uh, there are large numbers of marbled murrelets, uh, oftentimes, um, you know, almost uh, more than 100 that we can count during the trip. So marbled murrelets occur in big numbers and in slightly smaller numbers, but not uncommon at all around uh, Unalaska is the range-restricted Kitlitz's murrelet. Uh, which is easily seen during our pelagic here. And we some, can sometimes see it from land, but we usually see it better from the boat. And you can see here in the um, bottom left-hand corner, uh, there's a, one in flight. And you can see the white of the outer tail feathers, which is one, a good field mark uh, to tell the part from marbled murrelets in flight. And overall has a much more frosted appearance, of course, too. And uh, yeah, Dutch Harbor is a great place to see Kitlitz's murrelets. There are also puffins in uh, big numbers, uh, like tufted puffins. Uh, see several hundreds of those. And of course, horn puffins. Uh, I put this image in here just to show everybody just a number of seabirds out there. Once we get closer to the baby islands where uh, many of these alcids nest and feed, uh, we're talking thousands, if not tens of thousands, of puffins and myrrhs and myrrhlets. And we also record uh, slightly lower numbers of rhinoceros auklets. So another uh, great addition to the Alcid list. And uh, we do record several hundred ancient myrrhlets usually. And we can oftentimes get great views of them. Uh, so there'll be flocks of two dozen uh, taking off from the water, and sometimes we're just surrounded by ancient murrelets. Uh, it really depends on the year uh, a bit. Each year is slightly different. But ancient murrelets, easy to see during this pelagic. And we also record uh, smaller numbers of parakeet auklets. Uh, in fact, we do record all the possible auklets. The trickiest auklet, surprisingly, on this particular tour is least auklet, which happens to be one of the most numerous seabirds in the Bering Sea. But in this part of the Aleutians, it is not terribly common, but we can usually find them. But parakeet auklets occur in low numbers. And then, of course, the main prize of the tour, the whiskered auklet. This is a really small auklet. Um, it's quite a bit smaller than crested and parakeet, uh, about the size of a least, but uh, beautifully adorned with these uh, whiskers, plumes, and a small crest. And um, in... The baby islands, they occur by the thousands. Uh, I have had some trips where we counted probably at least 10,000, if not more. Um, usually we see them in the high hundreds or low thousands. But uh, we get great views of them as we move into the passes. You can see flocks and flocks of them taking off from the water. And uh, what we can oftentimes do, we'll let the uh, boat drift a little bit so we get closer to them. For photos and great views. 
And uh, of course, they're a bit skittish, take off from the water as we get closer. But uh, nevertheless, uh, fantastic to see this uh, range restricted auklet. So, unlike uh, all the other auklets, which uh, kind of are present and nest throughout the Bering Sea, the whiskered auklet in, the, in Alaska is mainly restricted to the Aleutian Islands. And here's another flock uh, taking off. And they're pretty easy to recognize even from a distance. These whiskered auklets uh, tend to fly in these really tight uh, flocks compared to some of the other alcids. And uh, we always scan these flocks carefully. I zoomed in a little bit here. Not a great picture, but if you look carefully, um, sort of there's a larger alcid uh, in the center there above the other ones that's a parakeet auklet. And then if you look carefully to the right, there is a crested auklet mixed in too. So it's actually quite interesting uh, on this tour, it's kind of reverse from anywhere else in the Bering Sea. You scan through the whiskered auklets here to try to find some of the other auklets because the whiskered auklets uh, really make up 99% of the numbers of auklets here. And we also find uh, Cassin's auklet. Uh, this uh, species usually occurs either single or in pairs. Uh, not always easy to pick out. Uh, they appear to be quite shy, either dive or take off quickly, but we can usually find uh, one or two. And then, of course, we also find common murs and thick-billed murs to round out the alcids uh, for this trip. And again, like I said, I, I can't think of too many other trips we do in Alaska that offer the chance of seeing 14 different species of alcids. Some of the other Alaska specialties we see are red-faced cormorants. Um, during the pelagic, we see uh, double-crested and pelagic cormorant and smaller numbers of red-faced cormorants. But we now have a little uh, route that we can do through um, some smaller islands nearby. We can go through some small passes where we have excellent chances of seeing red-faced cormorant. And we also see marine mammals, of course. Uh, like orcas or killer whales and humpback whales. And humpback whales are really numerous around Unalaska. You can see them from land right in the bays, and we oftentimes get great views. Uh, we can also see minke whale, uh, doll's porpoise, harbor porpoise. So it's also fantastic for marine mammals. And stellar sea lions also, along with harbor seals and uh, sea otters. Sea otters occur in very good numbers in the bays of Unalaska. So I hope you enjoyed it and it offered you a, an overview of our uh, Unalaska tour or uh, as we call it the Dutch Harbor Whiskered Auckland Quest and um, just to show you that there's a lot more to see than uh, the Whiskered Auckland. It is a really worthwhile tour to bird a neat wilderness area that is rarely visited by birders or tourists and uh, overall it's a wonderful uh, fairly relaxing trip and just a great addition to um, the adventures in Alaska.